have the moon in our shot. So while the moon was full when we actually shot this footage, by the time we wanted to release the footage, the moon wouldn't have looked like this. So really to help add to the realism of the shot, we need to get rid of the moon in this shot. So first things first, I'm going to resize my work area to probably what I'm going to be using for the final shot. So let's take a look at where the meteor comes in. Looks like it comes in right around four. So I'm going to give myself a few, maybe a second beforehand. Let's say we're going to start right around three seconds into the shot. I'm going to hit B in order to uh, trim my work area there. And then towards the end of the shot, once the meteor is going to go behind the house right around here, let's give it a second or so, maybe right around here, let's go ahead and trim our work area. So this is going to be the duration of our final shot. Now anytime you're shooting footage that you plan on editing, it's always a good idea to give yourself some room on either side to play with. So in this case, really because I don't really like the track that happened up here in the beginning, we could go in there and manually fix the track, which can be time consuming, or really because no one will know the difference, we can simply chop off the front of our shot. Now, if you do want to go in there and manually fix it, we do have plenty of courses at digitaltutors.com that can walk you through how to create tracks, fix tracking issues, and plenty of workflows that can really help you get that done. All right, so let's walk through painting out our moon. So first thing we're going to do is to double click on the background layer here. Oops, let's unlock that. Double click on that to open it up. Let's go ahead and zoom in, hit control plus in order to zoom in here. Now basically I'm going to use the clone stamp tool in order to paint this out, but before I do that, we're going to want to actually go in and create a track so we have the data of the position for this moon. So I'm going to come in and track my motion here. Now if you don't have this open, you can come up to window, tracker. I have it open from when we used it previously. Pull in a track here. Position it right over the moon. Zoom in nice and close. Now the first box here will want to be about the size of the moon. And then the second box will want to be about the size of the moon on either frame. So on a frame either uh, before or after. So if we move uh, uh, forward one frame, you can see the movement of the moon here. It's going to be well within this outside box. So we just want to make sure that we have plenty of room there for that. All right, so once we've got that, we're ready to go ahead and track our motion. So I'm going to analyze this forward and then pause the video while that analyzes. And once it's done analyzing, we can come back and let's analyze backwards. So I'm going to open up my background layer here. I hit U in order to show the keyframes. I'm going to come before my keyframe, hit K on the keyboard, and that will basically push me forward to the very first keyframe. So you can use J and K, J to go back one keyframe, and K in order to go forward one keyframe. Or you can use these little arrows here in order to jump between those. Basically, I want to get to the very first keyframe and then I'm going to come in and analyze backwards in order to get the rest of my track. So I'm going to hit that and then pause the video while that analyzes. Great, so we have our track here so you can see it following the moon in our shot. Now let's come in and actually paint out the moon. So I'm going to come in and make sure my uh, background layer is selected come up to the clone stamp tool. Uh, you can use the shortcut control B in order to access this. Once we have that, I'm going to zoom in here, give myself a little bit of room to work with. There we go. Now you can hold down control, left click and drag in order to make the brush larger. Uh, we can adjust our parameters for the brush here, maybe uh, increase the hardness just a little bit. Now if we hold down Alt, that will give us the source point. So basically if I click right here, then that's going to be the source point. 
and then when I paint, it's going to paint from wherever that source point was. So I'm going to want to find somewhere in the sky that is pretty close to what's around it. So, so I'm probably going to work with somewhere around here, because if you notice, there's a little bit of cloud right there. So I'm going to have my source point right here. And with one stroke, I'm just going to left click and paint it out. There we go. So we've painted out the moon here. So now what we need to do is to have that, uh, basically that paint stroke that we created to track along with our shot. So that's why we tracked the motion of the moon before. So we can come in, take our attach point here. I'm going to go to the very front frame in order to copy all of it. Hit Control C in order to copy all of those frames. And then on our paint here, let's close our stroke options, find the transform. And under the position, hit Control V in order to paste. And we should see that show up. Now, it's not going to show up until this a little block right here. So this is basically where on our shot our paint is going to show. So if we want to resize this, uh, you'll notice that there is nothing painted on the moon right here. So we can resize this guy right here. And we should have our paint on there. So we're not going to see it here in the layer here. Let's come back to our master composition. We should see that our moon is painted over for the entire shot. So there we go. So if I were to turn this off, you can see we have our moon. Turn it back on, and as I scrub through, we've successfully painted out our moon. Great, so now that we have our moon painted out, we're ready to move on to our next lesson, where we'll start building out our meteor's tail effect was to look at a ton of reference footage of actual meteors. Now, there's some great reference out there from an actual meteor shower that happened in Russia in 2013 that really helped us figure out what actual meteors look like. So here's an example. This is actually a dash cam footage from Russia, and you can notice the meteor coming in. Now, one thing that you'll notice with this meteor here is that you don't actually see a rock shooting across the sky. It really just kind of looks like a ball of light with a trail on it. So in order to mimic that look, the way we did that for our shot was to do it in two parts. We have a tail, which was right after uh, this ball of light area here, and then the actual stream itself, which really kind of ends up looking like something that you might see from an airplane or something like that. So in order to create this effect, let's hop back into After Effects here. I'm going to use Particular. Now, we're not really going to go in depth into how Particular works in this course, but if you're not familiar with Particular, I'd highly recommend you hop onto our site at digitaltutors.com and look at all of the tutorials that we've got for really a wide range of Red Giant plugins, Trap Codes Particular being one of those. So first things first, let's come in and create a solid. doesn't really matter what color that is. I'm going to create a solid. I'm going to call this my tail particles. There we go. Hit OK. Now let's come in and apply our particular effect. So under Effect, Trap Code, Particular. Now we want to actually hook up the light from Particular to the light in our scene for our tail. In this case, the tail emitter light that we created before. So in order, order to do that, let's come into the effect controls here. Under options, let's look for our tail emitter. There we go. Hit OK. And now it's really just a matter of coming in and setting up our preferences for particular. Now, before we go through the parameters, I want to point out that there really is no one-size-fits-all solution. really can't stress that enough. Basically, because of the way that particular works, the values that I use aren't going to be exactly the same values that you'll use for your shot. So I'd really encourage you to maybe use these values as a starting off point and then tweak and change them to really get a look that you like. 
All right, so with that in mind, let's look at the parameters that we're going to use for our meteor's tail. So I'm going to hop into the emitter here. First, I'm going to crank up the number of particles per second, something like 7,000. Uh, instead of using a point emitter type, let's actually use lights so we can see our particles in our shot here. I'm actually going to turn off the tracker. There we go. I also want to change the direction to be a directional maybe come in and decrease the velocity a little bit uh, adjust the random really crank that up Oop, adjust the velocity here uh, maybe just something like five to give a little bit of velocity but really randomize that velocity there just so everything doesn't look so even I was gonna come in and uh, maybe bump down the emitter size just a little bit there we go. Now you'll notice this particles per second modifier is set to light intensity. Now if you remember, we hooked up our particles to the tail emitter here in the options. So that means we can use our light intensity from the light here in order to control how many particles per second are being emitted. So I'm going to come in and maybe bump this down just a little bit in order to change up the amount of particles that are being emitted. There we go. So good with what's in the emitter here. Let's hop into the particle settings. I'm going to adjust the life to be about two seconds here. You can kind of see what we're getting here in the shot. Once again, come in and randomize this so everything doesn't die off at exactly two seconds. Adjust the particle type. I'm going to use a cloudlet particle type just because that's what we found kind of worked best for the look that we were going for. Adjust the feather on that. Now this size parameter is something that uh, we could animate if we wanted to in order to make the meteor effect kind of grow and shrink over time. Just something to keep in mind there if we wanted to do that later on. I'm also going to increase the randomness of the size. I'm going to hop in to the size over life and the opacity over life graphs. So these graphs can really have a profound effect on what your final result will look like. So if we come in here, we just left click and drag it in order to paint out this area here. Let's kind of get something. Uh, we want our particles to have a certain size when they start and then kind of die off to give us that kind of a trail look. So you can see kind of the effect that we're going for here. Uh, maybe adjust the opacity over life as well so everything isn't uh, at 100% opacity for, the, for its entire life. Maybe randomize some of that once again, just kind of getting some variation in the shot there. I'm also going to come in, adjust the color so it's not a pure white. Maybe a little bit of an off-white here. Adjust the color randomness once again, just kind of giving it some variation here. Well, the final thing I'm going to do for these tail particles here is to come into the shading and let's tweak some of these settings here. So I'm going to adjust the light fall off, uh, crank down the ambient, bump up the diffuse, something like that. Uh, adjust the shadow lit coloring. There we go. Let's uh, sample a color from our sky here just to kind of get some of that sky color into our meteor effect. Maybe dial it down a little bit so it's not quite so strong. Adjust our opacity. And we can adjust the size as well as the distance of our uh, shadow light coloring there. You'll notice the effect that we're getting here if I zoom in a little bit on our particles. Crank that up a little bit. There we go. That's looking pretty good. I'm also going to adjust the placement so it's always behind. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to come back into the size over life and just kind of tweak this a little bit more so the actual uh, tail isn't quite as long. 
There we go. Once again, this is really something that you can come in here and tweak and play with in order to get uh, whatever look is that you're going for. As I mentioned before, there's really no one-size-fits-all solution. So I'd really encourage you to jump in there, start playing around with the settings to really get the look that you want. And I might continue to make little tweaks here and there as uh, we continue through, as we build out the rest of our meteor. Uh, but for now, I'm happy with the way that the tail is looking for this guy here. So let's move on to the next lesson, where we'll start adding a stream of particles behind our meteor's tail. Here. All right, so this process is very similar to what we did with our tail emitter. First things first, I'm going to come in and create a new light. There we go. So layer, new light. This is going to be my stream emitter. And then really any point on the timeline here, we're going to give myself a little bit more room. Uh, what we want to do is to get our stream emitter here to actually be moving along with our tail emitter. So if I hit control shift H, we can see this is the tail emitter that we have with our trajectory want this to move along. So if you remember from a previous lesson, a very quick way of doing this is to come into our position here, copy and paste the position values. Once we have those position values set, you'll notice that our stream emitter is right on top of the tail. Now we can simply pick with this. So the stream emitter is now parented to the tail emitter and now our stream emitter is following along with our meteor. Great, so now we need to come in and actually create the particular particles. So I'm just going to duplicate the tail particle solid that we had, rename this stream particles, and come into the effects controls. And rather than hooking this up with the tail emitter light, we want to hook this to the stream emitter. And now that we have this set up, it's really just a matter of setting up our particles like we did in the last lesson. Except this time, because we've duplicated what we had from our tail particles, we'll be tweaking some of those parameters to make our particles look a little more like a stream coming from behind the tail. Now, as I mentioned before, the exact values you use doesn't really matter nearly as much as the final result. So feel free to play around with different settings to get the look that you want. All right, so I'm going to hop into the emitter here, maybe adjust the particles being emitted per second, uh, bump up the velocity just a little bit there. I'm also going to change the emitter size because we want our particles to that are coming out as a stream to be a little bit smaller than the particles that are uh, in the actual tail there. All right, so good with the emitter settings here. Under particles, let's come in and increase the life of our particles. So I'm going to put this to about 15 seconds. And basically what that's going to do is to make sure that the particles for our stream last for the duration of our shot. Because we want the stream to be on the shot the entire time or throughout the entire video. I'm also going to come in maybe bump down the size a little bit, increase the randomness, just kind of changing things up so we don't have the exact same look as our tail here. Let me decrease the opacity just a little bit. I'm also going to come in and adjust the graphs that we had in order to get a different look. So rather than having it start and then tail off, because we have that tail that we created separately, I'm going to have it start at nothing where that tail is and then kind of get bigger. So it's kind of maybe an effect like this. You can kind of see we have our tail and then it's going to start pretty small and then get bigger as time goes on. So that's going to give us the look of these as the... Uh, as it kind of dissipates in the sky, they're kind of starting to break up and it's going to start to give us that sort of a look. I'm going to do the same thing with the opacity graph here. Just that. There we go. Pretty cool. So you can see the look that we're getting. Now the final thing I'm going to do for the stream particles here is to come into an area that we didn't really touch in the tail, and that is the physics. 
So this is really going to adjust how the particles act over time. And since the stream particles are going to be on for the entire shot, this can kind of break it up and start to give us some of that dissipation of, or dissipated effect. So I'm going to adjust the air resistance here. Bump that up a little bit. Adjust the spin amplitude. Maybe have this under the turbulence here have it affect the size and the position just a little bit. You can kind of see what that's going to do when we adjust those values here. Basically, it's going to kind of start breaking it up so everything doesn't look so really so perfect. And usually when you have something that kind of starts that looks too perfect, that's when it's a pretty good indicator then it's CG. All right, so if we scrub through this to kind of get the look that we're going for here, that's looking pretty cool. Now, if you notice, this is very, very crisp, especially around the tail emitter here. Now, we can kind of get this to blend in a little bit more pretty easily by adding in something like a blur. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to come into Effect, Blur and Sharpen. I'm going to add a fast blur here. Maybe bump it up to something like 7. You can see it really just kind of helps it blend in with the sky. I'm going to do the same thing on the tail particle. So I'm going to copy this, hit control C, come over to my tail particles, hit control V in order to paste that, and you can see the effect that we're getting on our tail particles as well. Very, very cool stuff. So let's do a quick RAM preview to see kind of how this shot is looking so far. So I'm going to hit Shift-0 in order to do a RAM preview. Uh, when you hold down Shift, that's really going to preview every other frame. So it's just going to go a little bit faster, and it's still going to give us kind of the look of our shot. So I'm going to pause the video while this uh, previews real quick. All right, so this uh, RAM preview is just about done. There we go. So this is kind of the effect that we have so far. It's looking pretty cool. We have it coming onto the screen. Let me zoom out a little bit here so we can see everything. I once again hit Shift-0 in order to play back our RAM preview. You can see our meteor is coming on. It's coming over to the house, and then it's going right over top of the house. So. Uh, let's actually come in and adjust the position of our particles here so they're between the foreground and the background. So I'm going to take the tail particles, drag it between the stream particles. I'm actually going to put that behind the tail so that way the tail is kind of covering it up a little bit there. Now if we do a RAM preview, I'm going to adjust this to half so the RAM preview doesn't take quite as long. Hit Shift-0 in order to tell After Effects to calculate this. Uh, you can see it's going much, much faster as I'm doing, as I switch to half. You can see as this grows, this is the uh, RAM preview here, the progress that After Effects has made. See our meteor is coming across the sky. We've got some nice movement in our streak there. As it comes to get closer to the house, uh, using the alpha mat that we created, it should actually go behind the house instead of going over top of it, thanks to the position of the particles in our layers there. And there we go. So you can see it's actually going behind the house. Very, very cool. I'm going to hit Shift-0 and kind of pan down just a little bit so we can see this a little bit easier. You can see our meteor is going to come into the shot, come in and go behind the house. Very, very cool stuff. And I know I've mentioned this before, but I really can't stress enough. Don't take the values that I've used in the past couple of lessons as the only values that will work. If you're looking at reference of meteors, they really vary quite a bit. And even when we were R&Ding this exact shot, we never really got the exact same look twice. So I'd really encourage you to make this your own. 
All right, so we've got a bulk of our work done. Now let's move on to the next lesson where we'll really start adding some polish by adding in some light effects to work with another great After Effects plugin, No Light Factory. And again, we've got lots of tutorials over at digitaltutors.com that can show you how to use No Light Factory for really a wide range of projects. So for this course, we won't really go into how No Light Factory works in depth. All right, so let's start by creating a new solid for our light effects. I'm going to layer, new, solid. This will be our light effects layer. Uh, the color doesn't really matter. I'm just going to hit OK. Now let's come in and add a light. So the first light I'm going to add is under Effect, No Light Factory. I'm going to add a Light Factory Glow. There we go. Now you'll notice that this actually gets added to a black background. So in order to see this, I'm going to add in another effect here, and that is the Unmalt effect. So that's going to unmultiply our... A light factory so we can see this over our actual footage. All right, so we want our light to actually be moving along with our meteor. Now, if you remember in a previous lesson, we converted all of our 3D tracking data to 2D data. Now, if you notice here in light factory, our light source location, which is going to be the position of the actual light itself. So if I move this, You'll notice that our light moves. You notice this is only X and Y data. There's no Z data. So this is where we're really going to be glad that we went through the process beforehand to convert the 3D data to 2D data. So now we can just speed right along. Really all we need to do is to take this light source location and connect it with our 2D tracking data that we created before. Now we can do that in our timeline using a very simple expression. So I'm going to hop over here and let's open up our light effects here. So get our effect. This is our light source location. We want that to be driven by the position of the 2D tracking data null that we created. So I'm going to give myself a little bit more room in my timeline here hold down Alt and then cli left click on the stopwatch, that's going to open up the expression. Now once we have our expression open, all we really need to do is to take our pick whip and connect it to the position. And that's going to build our expression for us. Pretty cool stuff. So now let's hop back and see what has happened. You can see right away it's connected to our meteor and as we scrub through, the position is being updated for us automatically. That's what the red means. It means it's uh, connected by an expression. And it's being driven by the position of the null that we created before with our 2D tracking data. Really, really cool stuff. All right, so let's come in and edit some of the settings for our light here. So I'm not really going to adjust the global brightness and the global scale because we're actually going to be animating those as the meteor streaks across the sky. So for now, I'm just going to leave those at the default. I'm going to adjust some of the other values. So I'm going to adjust maybe the ring softness, bump that up just a little bit, adjust the ring scale, maybe bring that down just a hair, crank up the gamma for this, and then adjust the actual color itself. So rather than being uh, pink and purple here, let's maybe make this kind of an off-white and maybe something a little more like kind of an orangish color we would kind of expect to get. There we go. Hit Control shift h in order to hide everything. You can kind of see the effect that we're getting there. Very cool. So let's come back. If you actually notice uh, at the beginning of our shot, Looks like for about a second here, looks like our light is stuck at the very top. Now the reason for that has to do with the position here of our tracking data. So if hit Control Shift H and we come up to our tracking data, you'll notice that it actually just kind of gets stuck here at the top. So our light 
doesn't really start to move until the meteor comes in. Now there's a couple different ways that we can fix this. One, we could animate the light itself to not turn on until the meteor comes into the shot, but a better result would be to actually take this null and adjust the position so that it really just kind of starts to move off screen to follow the trajectory of the meteor, which is this right here. And it looks like really there's only a few frames that we'll need to do that with. So we can do this manually pretty easily. All we'll need to do is to take this uh, position here and really just adjust the null and move it in position for each frame. So you can see the process here, just coming in, dragging it, moving it, and so on. So I'm going to go through and do this for the rest of the frames up until we get until it goes off screen here. Looks like we probably have about a second or so worth of work to do. So I'll go ahead and do that between lessons, but then we'll pick up in the next lesson and look at a technique for organizing our light's global brightness and scale so they're ready to be animated.